Godzilla, Gamera, short of the eighth wonder of the world, two kaiju franchises reign supreme, the king of the monsters, and the guardian of the universe. They had a death battle! And amongst the many villains the two have faced, only two can consider themselves the anti-Godzilla and the anti-Gamera. King Ghidorah and Gaius? Uh, no, no, they're just the primary antagonists of the franchise. Also, Gaius gets fucking murked. Oh, uh, okay. Destoroya, the ultimate life form and anti-Godzilla of the Heisei era. And Iris, the evil god and anti-Gamera of the Heisei trilogy. He's not Wiz and I'm not Boomstick! And it's our job to analyze their weapons, armors, and skills to find out who would win a not death battle. Wait, neither of them have any of those things. What the fuck? The year was 1954. America tested its new large, very big fucking bomb, Castle Bravo. The explosion was far bigger than what they expected. Nuclear fallout shelled the area, and below the waves, an ancient sea creature was awakened. Gojira, otherwise known as the King of the Monsters, Godzilla. Godzilla ravaged Japan, enraged from the death of his family and the scars that were burnt into his very being. Tokyo was in strife, until Dr. Daisuke Serizawa revealed the Oxygen Destroyer, a weapon that could put Godzilla down for good. Though the power of the device scared Serizawa and prevented him from using it, he eventually relented. Sacrificing himself, destroying all of his research, and unleashing the weapon, Serizawa and Godzilla perished together. But little did Serizawa know just how justified his fears were. Living within the strata under Tokyo Bay, where he unleashed the destroyer, was a colony of microscopic crustaceans from the pre-Cambrian era. Due to their origins in anaerobic environments, the crustaceans mutated and evolved, incorporating microoxygen into their very being. In response to the Tokyo Bay Aqualine being built, the crustaceans left the ocean, consuming all that was in their path and further evolving, from their small juvenile states to the larger aggregate state, to finally... Perfect Destoroya! Hold on, are we just not gonna question our crustaceans from the pre cambrian area? Fuck. Era? We're living in the strata? Yeah, it does seem kinda weird, given the pre-Cambrian period ended 541 million years ago. While the crustaceans didn't evolve into the middle Cambrian era, at best 509 million years ago. No, not that. I mean, how does this guy have crabs? It's definitely not chadly enough for an STD, unlike me. I've got at least seven! Like a real Chad. Grab them in the brain, I'm pretty sure. You're right. Ostracods did evolve within the late pre-Cambrian, but they're very different than- Okay, what?! Yeah, bet you're jealous of my STDs. There's way too much to unpack there. What, three in my brain, four elsewhere? I'm pretty sure there's a secret one. Okay, there. okay, what the fuck?! Standing at 120 meters and weighing 80,000 metric tons, the perfect form of Destoroyer is a massive demonic perfect life form. It was so evil, he literally seeks nothing else than the total annihilation of all life forms in existence. Wait, does that include him too? Yeah, I mean, that it depends on how far you extend the definition of life form. Destoroyer might as well be the antithesis of life itself. He is the literal incarnation of the Oxygen Destroyer. The Oxygen Destroyer being a device that literally splits and liquefies oxygen molecules. It is a weapon that straight up destroys oxygen on a molecular level. And that's what Destroyer has running through his very body. In fact, it's literally what powers his main attack, the Micro-Oxygen Ray. Wait, what's Micro-Oxygen? Oh, it's the particle that the Oxygen Destroyer uses to destroy oxygen. Wait, it destroys oxygen with the Micro-Oxygen? Yes. What well, is that? The Micro-Oxygen Ray disintegrates organic matter, and is strong enough to kill Godzilla Jr. and pretty much anything in its way. But when enemies get close, he can fight in melee using his variable slicer. A big orange kaiju-sized lightsaber that goes straight through organic flesh. And while his arms might look small and insubstantial, he can hey, still I'm pick not. up and carry other small kaiju or use his tail as a weapon. His tail can wrap around and grab onto things with the pincer at the end. It also allows him to drain energy from his opponents. Absorbing energy is a favorite move in Destroyer 2. According to the 1996 Godzilla vs. Destroyer Super Complete Works, Destroyer literally dissolves organic cells with his micro-oxygen and absorbs their DNA to further involve. This is in fact what allowed him to mutate into Perfect Destroyer after absorbing the DNA from Godzilla Jr. So it's not like he's stuck in this form. Destroyer is able to split back into multiple 40 meter tall aggregate destroyers. That's a lot of them. Somehow despite each individual aggregate weighing 15,000 metric tons, he can split into far more than what his 80,000 ton mass would suggest. Yeah, you assume he can only form four aggregates and one aggregate as a third smaller, but 
No, he can fully swarm you. In his aggregate state, he could not only best Godzilla Jr. in overwhelm him in battle, but multiple could even topple a Daddy Godzilla himself. A testament to the raw power wielded by this massive monster. He's so strong he could pick up and throw Godzilla with his tail. In this scene, Destroyer threw Godzilla more than twice his own length in a span of three seconds. Throwing Godzilla at the speed would require a force of more than 127 tons of TNT. But even that pales in comparison to the force Destroyer would generate just by flying. Now, Destroyer doesn't have an official flight speed, however it is reasonable to assume he is below Rodan and Space Godzilla, but above Mogiro and Mecha Godzilla, which would put his speed anywhere between Mach 1 and Mach 3. Even if we seriously said it was only Mach 1, then at 80,000 tons he would generate energy worth over 1,000 tons of TNT just by crashing into things. Unfortunately, it's rather hard to pin any meaningful speed to Destroyer. His only real speed feat involved traveling 938.4 meters in 5 seconds, which would only equate to 187.68 meters per second or have the speed of sound. But he was carrying the 60,000 ton Godzilla at the time and was clearly accelerating as he began to lift Godzilla up. Mind you, even with that speed, to carry both of their weights combined would generate 589 tons of TNT. So it's not like even that would even be a small amount of power. But he doesn't really need speed when he has the micro oxygen ray. Multiple beams within the Hazer era have very fast feats of speed, ranging from Mach 5 from the Batcher larvae to Mach 13 from Godzilla himself. And based on how this is portrayed comparable to the atomic breath, there's no reason it shouldn't be at a similar speed. The Destroyer himself, though, isn't terribly fast. While he is probably at least Mark 1, he's not the most agile. All it takes is a good look at him to tell that much. Luckily, he can take a lot of punishment. Not only can he survive large chunks of him being blasted off, but also survive multiple blasts from Burning Godzilla. And that's no mean feat. Burning Godzilla, or Godzilla in general, is a brute. Hey, Burning. Not only has Godzilla got plenty of his own insane feats, but Burning Godzilla's atomic breath, the infinite spiral heat ray, is significantly more powerful than the burn spiral heat ray that killed Space Godzilla and the Hyper Uranium Heat Ray that killed Mega Godzilla. While Mega Godzilla is one thing, Space Godzilla could travel at near the speed of light, and with its immense weight that would be a potential energy of 1.9 petatons of TNT. And Godzilla has his own impressive feats of war power, outside of, uh, you know, BURNING CABOL! In his battle with Batra, he slammed the pool of lava hard enough to shift tectonic plates and cause a volcanic eruption. While the film does have some characters saying it's because of the meteor, this is way after the meteor hit, and like, a long time after. In fact, it's directly shown to us that this happened because of Batra hitting the floor. The scientists say it's because of the meteor because they literally cannot see what happened. Bruh, I'm terminally blind, and I can see what happened. Not to mention, at the very start of Destroyer's very film, Godzilla survives an entire island blowing up in his face. A force of at least 4 gigatons of TNT. Destroyer himself possesses an ungodly amount of power. Recall how the Oxygen Destroyer works? Well, it literally splits oxygen, and the characters outright say that it could lay waste to all of Tokyo. It's like a whole city! And that's not just a meaningless feat. The amount of energy it takes to split all the oxygen in Tokyo has been calculated to 23.47 petatons of TNT. And that's just from one Oxygen Destroyer. A power that destroyer... Ha! Huh? Would you look at that? Fury read it clean should wield at least a portion of it. I said that half right, you can sh shut, shut Screw the Screw it up. But despite how impressively built Destroyer is, he is far from infallible. While Destroyer is large and very impressive, he was still taking a lot of damage from burning up those attacks. And if he is frozen, his cells can't separate and he'll die when his body is destroyed. That's in fact what killed him, being frozen and crashing into the heat around burning Godzilla to explode. And while some adaptions have hadn't survived that, we're not including those, so fuck him! He's also generally vulnerable to intense heat, though he was able to survive being exposed to Burning Godzilla and his attacks for a while. He's also rather slow overall, not being the most agile of Heisei Kaiju. Though that hardly stops him from being a threat, Destroyer is clearly not just any wild animal. He actively seeks to harm Godzilla, both physically and emotionally, killing his son before his eyes and even laughing about it. Destroyer is called the perfect life form for a reason. Super Fighter Ball of Fight! That's the adult destroyer. I've never seen anything so big. I think we better get out of here. The year was 1995. Three massive creatures known as Gauss had hatched from Himegami Island and began to terrorize Japan. 
fair too bad. Created thousands of years ago by the ancient Atlanteans, the Gyros sunk Atlantis itself and now began their attack on Japan. Wow, but, you guys suck. But they weren't the only creatures from ancient Atlantis to awaken. <laughs> Camera, the guardian of the universe, a massive turtle monster that fought off the Gyros. But one survived and evolved into the mighty Super Gauss. And that's a creative fucking name, let me tell you that. You'll want to talk, Nawiz. Shut up, Nipple Man. But during his cataclysmic battle with the Super Gauss, Japan was left ravaged. And to Ayana Hidesaka, her entire family was killed when they tried to evacuate. Taken in by a foster family, Ayana grew cold and distant to the world, tormented by nightmares about Camera. The monster she blamed for her parents' death. That was until a group of bullies promised her and her brother that they wouldn't pick on them if they took an egg from the shine of Ryu Seiko. When Ayana did so, much to the surprise of everyone due to the legends of the egg being immovable, a bond was formed. The egg hatched into a strange creature which over time began to evolve and grow until it finally reached its full size. Ayana named the creature... Donatello! Wait, fuck! It's a turtle! Iris the evil god. Aye, 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 sure. Standing 99 meters tall and weighing only 199 metric tons, Iris is a massive monster believed to have been created by the Atlanteans as a countermeasure if Gamera ever were to go out of control. And being bonded to Ayana through the Atlantean Magamata, Iris lives to kill Gamera and little else. Though, uh, his origins are kind of contested. Some believe him to be the ancient demon Ryuseiko that will bring the end to the world. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Be the mighty Japanese demon who was literally born as a tiny squishy monster that can barely do anything. Oh, that would be sure to Some believe he's the vermilion bird of the Chinese constellations, destined to fight the black tortoise. First off, fucking racist. Second off, yeah, bird. Have a nice day. Sure thing. The big ass jellyfish motherfucker is a bird as much as I am a reasonable authority figure and all around good role model. Others believe he's a mutated ancient gauss reaching his fullest potential. Ah yes, yeah, that looks like a garrus to me. Caught in Pokemon Go yesterday. But the most likely origin is that it was an Atlantean beast made to kill Gamera who didn't hatch until the modern day. See now that I semi understand. I get needed to make a failsafe in case something goes out of control. Like how I made Pornopedia 7000 in case Pornopedia 6000 ever went out of control. How'd that turn out? Um. I am coming, come to defeat you! Very well. Going stronger over time, Iris began life small and docile, but slowly absorbing and consumed people until it reached maturity using its four long tentacles, each one measuring two kilometers in length. That's pretty long, ain't it? Yeah. Yeah. Iris is physically bonded to Ayana through the Magamata, increasing his power. But even without it, he could just eat her up with his chest-mounted gene snatcher. Okay. And that's not his only method of stealing genes. Using the spear absorbers in his arms, Iris can impale and drain the blood of his enemies, adapting its DNA with that of its foe. With it, Iris was able to recreate Gamera's own plasma fireballs with the overboost plasma. Two massive fireballs. Who would have fucked it? These fireballs are launched to the end of his tentacle answers. Blades held at the end of his tentacles that don't just shoot fire, but also the supersonic scalpel. The supersonic scalpel is an incredible sharp beam of energy capable of cutting through both Gamera's flesh and even his shell. They can also form the anti-plasma field to swat away Gamera's own, oh would you look at that, plasma fireballs. Iris can furthermore grow membranes between them to achieve flight of up to Mach 9. Though Gamera is able to keep up with Iris at Mach 3.5. So it's likely Iris has to take a good amount of time to accelerate to full speed. Though it's not like he needs to, he's nimble enough to find the air just as well on land. Iris is so fast he can block four fireballs firing from Gamera as if it was nothing. Now, Gamera at this point could be seen flying from cloud height. It takes him uh, 45 seconds to reach the ground. Though that would give a ridiculous height, so if we take into account cinematic timing and only count the time he was on screen and the time spent with characters reacting to him, they'll take the time of only 30 seconds. At a full speed of Mark 3.5, that would give him an absurd distance of 36,015 meters. However, Gamera fires up his fireballs 10 seconds in, meaning it was 24,010 meters high. The fireballs managed to reach this distance above ground in 2 seconds, about 2 hours as tall. Meaning the fireballs travel 23,810 meters in 2 seconds. That would mean these fireballs were moving at Mach 34.7, and Iris' tentacles could move fast enough to block it, even moving at similar speeds. 
Though the tentacles only have to move 200 meters in 2 seconds, meaning technically they only needed to move at speeds of 100 meters per second to be able to block them, but this still means Iris could respond to and block some really fast fireballs. And while Iris is far from a rural powerhouse, he's still strong enough to impale Gamera through the shell. Though he did stab Gamera from the front, his scalpels could still cut through the shell. And Gamera is not a weakling. He's capable of throwing around the 75 ton Super Gauss and uprooting a 3000 ton Legion Flower. Just by flying at Mark 9, Iris would also be capable of generating up to 226 tons of TNT. But Iris is clearly capable of doing more than that. Gamera could survive crashing from orbit. Assuming this was from the Carmen line, Gamera and Gauss fell from a height of 100 kilometers, meaning he came down to Mach 4. With his mash, that would be a crash worth 28 tons of TNT. Well, screw that! He later tanked the Legion Flower exploding in his face! Keep in mind, while this explosion took out Sendai, it's also stated to have the full range of 12 kilometers had Gamera not wrapped around it. Such an immense explosion would come out to at least one gigaton of TMT. That's enough force to wipe a large mountain out in a single blast. While Gamera clearly was more affected by that than he was by Iris' attacks, Gamera got even stronger after that film, where he absorbed the monitor of most of the planet, and he killed Legion in one shot. Given a single fireball from Gamera couldn't even damage a Legion flower, and this could destroy the entire Legion Queen in one blast, that's an impressive boost. Now, while this may have been temporary, it's noted in Revenge of Iris that the levels of mana in the planet are still depleted. So Gamera didn't give it all back. If we assume Gamera still wields all that mana in him, then he's gonna be a lot powerful than he already is. That's English. If we assume Gamera got a 100 times boost, then he wields a potential power of 100 gigatons of TNT. Though this is a high ball, Iris honestly doesn't have many raw power feats of his own. And while Gamera does have some more impressive flight feats, with these kaiju's mass, that still wouldn't come out to a more impressive number. So we'll just go with the 100 gigatons of TNT for now. Luckily, Iris has enough for us to see he's a pretty durable lad. Gamera had trouble harming him at all in their fight, only being able to do damage punching into Iris' chest. But even then, Iris only lost because Gamera weaponized his own fire against him. Iris seems to also have a weak spot in his stomach, as Gamera was able to plunge his hand into it far easier than any other part of Iris, ribbing out Iris' entrails and also Ayana. Yeah, Ayana eventually realized that she was being a massive fucking idiot, and maybe that the best way to deal with Gamera destroying her family is not to have Iris destroy an entire city. It deflects Gamera's fireballs in such a way that probably even more families died. Wow, who would have known that killing random people was not the way to make up for your family's random death? Not that Iris gave a shit given he just opened his stomach in tentacle water. Yeah, and if she isn't within him, her link is only as deep as this little bead. If that goes tits up, Iris is weakened by an unknown amount. Despite this, Iris's weaknesses are far outweighed by his strength. With immense speed and agility and surprising power and range, Iris was able to cripple even the mighty Gamera, forcing him to tear off his own arm. Whatever you do, make sure to avoid Iris, the evil god. Iris just wanted that damn arm! <laughs> Alright, the giant monsters are ready and the... Hey, they are the combatants, so they are set. It's time to end this semi-important debate once and for all. It's time for a not death battle! Fight!
surface level, this match certainly seemed quite even. While Destroyer is a tough beast, Iris's overboost plasma directly took advantage of his weaknesses to high temperatures. Meanwhile, Iris's ability to drain DNA probably wouldn't have been a good idea on a creature literally made of micro-oxygen. And if you're wondering whether or not Iris would be affected by micro-oxygen, there's no reason he wouldn't. Iris isn't some alien monster that just doesn't need oxygen. Oh, it's the Furious Proof otherwise! Very realistic. Gamma Ray and Gauss still appear to breathe, and Legion is a unique creature in that it releases oxygen. Iris is definitely not like Legion. Essentially, there's no evidence it shouldn't work. And even if it didn't, Iris' body still clearly contains liquids. So Destroyer's microscopic cells would likely consume Iris from the inside out, much like they did with fish in an aquarium. Beyond that, Iris also has significantly better melee range. But Destroyer's micro-oxygen ray made up for that. Despite how Iris was between 3 and 18 times faster at full pace, the problem comes down to acceleration. Iris clearly needs to accelerate to full speed to accomplish full Mark 9 as Gamera could keep up with him for a while, until the end where Iris clearly began to get further away. Not to mention, despite that speed, Iris would still have a hard time dodging. While Destroyer's Mach 13 Ray is way slower than the Mach 34.7 Plaza Fireballs, all this means would be that Iris could block them with his tentacles, not that he could dodge them physically. These two are fucking massive and humongous targets too. And even if you were to scale Iris to the speed of Gamera's best pace, that would only be fair if you did the same for Destroyer. Gamera's most impressive feat was travelling from Sendai to Tonagawa River in a span of only 13 seconds, a feat requiring him to travel 71.6 times the speed of sound. Even his flight into orbit doesn't match that. But then Godzilla had the capacity to tag Badger and Mothra. Mothra especially was able to travel over Mach 222 when she left the atmosphere of Earth. And she has giant fucking wings, she fly really fast. Yes, very good observation. But while Destroyer certainly isn't that fast, there's no reason his micro-oxygen ray shouldn't be. Even then, Iris wouldn't want to block the attack, he'd rather try and aim dodge it. Destroyer's power is far higher than what Iris can avoid. Even highballing Iris to 100 gigatons of TNT, the oxygen destroyer could output 23.47 petatons of TNT. A difference of over 23,470,000 times. Even if Destroyer was much weaker than the oxygen destroyer, despite the fact that both compose of literally the same molecule, and Destroyer was much bigger than it, It'd be hard for it to be worth only 100 gigatons of TNT. Destroyer scales are their impressive feats too. Gamera surviving a mountain destroying explosion is cool. But what's cooler? Godzilla literally shifting tectonic plates by hitting them with a giant larvae. Or scaling to Mogera, taking a pentaton of TNT smashing him in the face. Or taking hits from Batra, we can destroy planet busting meteors. Or Godzilla cells surviving a trip through a black hole and being exposed to supernovas to create Space Godzilla. Heck, he tanked an 850,000 ton meteor crushing right on his face with enough force to cause global eruptions. Scaling this battle only makes things worse for Iris. But of course, what about the overboost plasma? Well, one, dumb name, and two, let's compare it to the temperature to that of the temperature of burning Godzilla's atomic breath. Officially, burning Godzilla uses the burning heat ray and the infinite heat ray. Both of these are considered hotter and more powerful than what it could accomplish prior, such as the hyperuranium heat ray, which has an official temperature of 1.2 million degrees Celsius. Gamera, meanwhile, has no canonical plasma temperature, but we can make assumptions, for instance, if his plasma was hot as the inner core of the Earth, which then it'd only be 3,430 degrees Celsius, and most natural plasmas only reach up to 11,426 degrees Celsius. Even if the overboost plasma was as hot as the infinite spiral heat ray, which is unlikely given Godzilla was so high he was threatening to destroy the entire planet, Destoroy was able to survive multiple blasts from the extremely powerful shots he was hit with. And Iris' supersonic scalpel, even if it could harm Destroyer, is more likely what he'd use throughout the fight. And even if his overboost plasma was really that deadly, Destroyer could just split into his aggregate form and he'd be very hard to hit. A horde of Legion soldiers could overwhelm Gamera, and a horde of aggregate destroyers could overwhelm Godzilla. Iris would have trouble with that many, especially because he only has four tentacles, and burning Godzilla killed a few himself, but that didn't stop Destroyer from returning to his perfect form. So not only is it questionable that the Orbus Plasma could be hot enough to bypass Destroyer's natural durability, but even if it did, Destroyer could likely survive and split in response. And Iris had no way to exploit his weakness to the cold. Not to mention, while well, Iris couldn't evolve by consuming Destroyer's energy, Destroyer <laughs> could potentially evolve by draining Iris's. Even if all this wasn't enough, Iris is still powered by Ayana. If she's inside Iris, the Destroyer will have no trouble killing her by just blasting Iris. And if she's just nearby, 
then she's going to be relatively close, close enough to be within a city block's distance, of a giant 80,000 ton monster that releases particles that destroy oxygen. And look, even if you seriously ignored all their scaling, all of the oxygen destroyer related calcs and look solely at war power from their own feats, destroyer at Mark 1 would be carrying 1,124 tons of TNT, while Iris at Mark 9 would be only carrying 226 tons of TNT. If they rammed head on into each other, destroyer will just go for Iris. Not fair. Destroyer might be 18 times slower than Iris, but due to their sizes, Iris isn't going to be blitzing destroyer anytime soon. And Destroyer's micro-oxygen rate would be just as hard for her to avoid as her technical lances would be for Destroyer to avoid. Overall, well, Iris was faster, as stated, had better melee range, and had ways to exploit Destroyer's weaknesses, he just didn't have enough raw power to truly match... Uh... The life... The life Destroyer. Iris's chances were oxygenerally destroyed. The winner is Destroyer! It is a weapon that straight up destroys oxygen on a molecular level. <laughs> it sounded like molecular animation rewind there. On a molecular level. And he destroys it on a molecular level. <laughs> Number <Wait>. 15, the oxygen <laughs> destroyer. <laughs> the last thing you want in your Burger King burger is someone's oxygen. But... Just like Godzilla, that's what you might get. But Godzilla. wait, that shit's gone. Godzilla didn't die from the oxygen destroyer. He died because he ate a Burger King burger with foot lettuce no. and oxygen. Yeah, he ate it, dropped some of the lettuce, he stepped on it. <laughs> then put it back in the burger and ate it. And Zerizaga, whatever his name is, just killed himself with the bomb. <laughs> Bro, we're unraveling the Godzilla lore don't, as we don't, speak. Don't. Here's the question. Who made Godzilla a burger that big? Destroyer? <laughs> I mean, it didn't exist before <laughs> then, but, you know, shut up. Time travel Time exists, travel. I'm sure. Time. Huh? But multiple could even topple a daddy Godzilla himself. That came out wrong. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> a daddy Godzilla. I need a drink. Oh my god, my voice. Multiple beings in the Heisei era have reached some very sparse... I'm not even... Not boomstick. This is unnatural of you. Not boomstick, no! He is also generally vulnerable to intense heat, though he was able to survive being exposed to burning Godzilla and his attacks for a while. He's also rather slow overall, not being the most agile of Heisei Kaiju. But... Super vulnerable! To... To... Haha, <laughs> you're not getting that today. Learn that! Yeah, he's got a mouth on his boobs. <laughs> not uh chest nipples, but mouth boob! Mouth okay. Is it mouth nipples or chest mouthles? Just say the line, for I become terminally blind again. Iris's chances were oxygenerally destroyed. I'll give you that one for the pun. Nearly as bad as Mineral, but not. Mineral. <laughs>